Hey, it's Professor Dave. I want to show you the Beckman rearrangement. He knows a lot about the science stuff, Professor Dave explains. So we're going to take a look at this reaction called the Beckman rearrangement, uh, developed in 1886 by a German fellow named Ernst Beckman. So it's pretty old chemistry here. Uh, and, and the purpose, just to give you the broad overview, the purpose of this reaction is to transform a ketone into an amide. So you can see we've got two R groups here, R1 and R2 on this ketone, and then we're get, going to the amide, which essentially means that all we've done is we've taken a nitrogen atom and we've inserted it into one of those uh, carbonyl-carbon alkyl group bonds. So that's right in there. So the R2 has shifted one position over and we've got the nitrogen in there instead. So Let's take a look at the mechanism here. We've got our ketone here, and we're gonna uh, we're gonna react with uh, with this compound here, NH2OH, and this nitrogen atom is able to attack here. Okay, so <clears throat> and uh, and we're we're gonna we're gonna skip a little bit here, but we know that this oxygen there's gonna be some proton transfer. We're gonna lose that oxygen in the form of water. That's gonna leave completely, and then this group is now on there. So the nitrogen atom is going to attack. It's actually gonna attack twice. It's kind of similar to some of the reactions we've looked at about uh, imine formation and enamine formation, that kind of stuff. It's just gonna attack, kick that water off, and, uh, and we've got actually what's called an oxime. So this functional group is called an oxime where we've got C double bond N with, an, with a hydroxyl on the nitrogen. That's what that functional group is called, is an oxime. And now what can happen is uh, we can uh, there's a couple of ways to do this. A very simple way is to just protonate it. We can be doing this in acidic conditions. We can also turn this hydroxyl into some kind of leaving group derivative, like a sulfonate or something like that, but we'll just keep it simple. We're just going to protonate so we've got a water leaving group right there. And now this is where the rearrangement takes place. So what can happen is this carbon-carbon bond can, uh, can go here, kicking off water, and then nitrogen can go, let's put that lone pair, can go and pick up the alkyl group. So you can see that this carbon-carbon bond has now become a third carbon-nitrogen bond, thus kicking off water, while nitrogen goes and, uh, and coordinates to that alkyl group in its place. So it, we've, we've rearranged things uh, essentially based on, on, on thermodynamics, right? We're talking about bond energies. But if we cook it up, this is what's gonna happen. A little bit of heat, we can get rid of water uh, and we can totally rearrange this thing. So it's a little tricky looking, but see if you can follow the bonds. Uh, what we're left with has two resonance structures. We'll look at this one first. We've got R1 connected to this carbon and now this carbon has that third bond right here, right? This arrow means there's now three bonds to nitrogen. We've kicked that off, but this nitrogen is now coordinated to R2, right? So this is the key step. This is the way that nitrogen gets stuck in there. It's not that nitrogen was forced into a carbon-carbon bond. It's due to this rearrangement where uh, things sort of swap places. So nitrogen is now bound to R2. This is one of the resonance structures of what we're left with, but we can also, this has a formal positive charge here. We know that carbon is more electropositive. It's a little more favorable for carbon to be positively charged than nitrogen. And so we can take one of these pi bonds, put it onto nitrogen, thereby uh, putting the positive charge over onto carbon. These are two resonance structures. This one may be slightly more contributing. And this is also the one that will make sense. Water is now going to react with that carbon, and there will be some uh, rearrangement, uh, and we're going to end up with our amide product. Okay, so <clears throat> this is the uh, very basic, uh, most basic mechanism for the Beckman rearrangement. There is a little bit more to talk about because the thing is, w uh, if we have an asymmetric ketone, meaning uh, two different R groups, we can get a discrepancy where we then have to decide which R group is going to be the one that migrates in the rearrangement. And so we could go over many, many uh, examples, but just to summarize, basically, the R2 group in this case, the one that is migrating, uh, because this sigma bond is, 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 sort of, uh, is sort of dissipating as this one is forming, it does have to sustain a very slight partial positivity in the migration. Therefore, the more substituted R group or the carbon that is more substituted connected to this carbon is going to be the one that's a little bit more favorable to be transferred. Now, there are many examples and we could look, look at product distributions, but to just say that in a very basic way that the group, let's say that this was a more branched group than this one, that is what would make that 
that more favorable to be transferred, but we can have a, a, a product mixture uh, with each group migrating uh, in different circumstances. But this is the Beckman rearrangement. We've got a ketone, we're forming the oxime, and then this is the key rearrangement step where things sort of swap order, and then water attacks and we get our amide. So that's the basic mechanism for the Beckman rearrangement. So let's just look at two more things real quick. With the Beckman rearrangement, let's just uh, take a look at a cyclic, uh, a cyclic substrate. It's basically the same thing, but it's just a little bit interesting. We've got cyclohexanone. Again, we're going to do the same thing, react with the same uh, 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 material, and we're going to get our oxime, just like before, we're going to get our oxime. Uh, but then what's going to happen after the rearrangement, remember that we're inserting that nitrogen, right? This is going to pop out, and it, the nitrogen is going to end up in the ring. And so what we end up with is a cyclic amide, and uh, just an interesting bit of information, a cyclic amide is called a lactam. Just like a cyclic ester is called a lactone, uh, the similar terminology is for a cyclic amide, we're going to call that a lactam. And this is actually very interesting chemistry because you'll notice we've created a seven-membered ring. Right, and so six-membered rings are very common. Uh, seven-membered rings are a little bit more, uh, more difficult to form. And so if you happen to want a seven-membered lactam, this is actually the, a very, very good uh, technique to use because in, uh, in, you're getting both the seven-membered ring and the nitrogen inserted in the ring in one reaction here. So we, we've got our seven-membered uh, lactam. So that's what happens when we use a cyclic substrate. So uh, one limitation that we also want to talk about with the Beckman rearrangement Remember that we said that the, the R group that migrates, to, uh, that, that forms the new bond to the nitrogen, is typically going to be the one that is uh, more substituted because it has to sustain some partial positivity in the transition state as it migrates, as, as it coordinates to the nitrogen. And so we do want to be aware of something called uh, uh, Beckman fragmentation. So this is actually Beckman fragmentation. And so what happens is we've got uh, this group here, right? So uh, we've got, this is a tertiary carbon. And so what we expect, we know that this carbon, er, sorry, this bond is going to go here and we're going to kick off water. But what we expect is for the nitrogen to then go and, and finish off the rearrangement and uh, coordinate to this carbon. But because this is a, ter because this is a tertiary carbon and uh, tertiary carbocation is, is quite stable, sometimes what we can get is just a fragmentation whereby we do not achieve this nitrogen carbon bond. And so if you follow, we've got our group and then this carbon, and then the new bond, we've got a triple bond to nitrogen, and we're just going to be left with a nitrile, and then the tertiary carbocation will be left on its own, we'll lose one of these protons, we'll, uh, we'll, right, we'll, get, uh, we'll get the alkene product. And so this is just something to be aware of. If you have a situation like this, where you have a lot of branching, right, this carbon has, is connected to three other carbons, so the, uh, it's, it's energetically feasible for this to remain on its own without having to uh, gain another bond to nitrogen. So this is the Beckman fragmentation. This is the one main limitation we need to be aware of uh, when looking at Beckman rearrangement. But that's a little overview of the Beckman rearrangement. Thanks for watching, guys. Subscribe to my channel for more tutorials. Support me on Patreon so I can keep making content. And as always, feel free to email me, ProfessorDaveExplains at gmail.com.